that song we just sang too, as Jesus is mine. You know, and uh, I was thinking just that picture that came into my mind as we were singing that song was the day he was ascended into heaven. Remember that? He was received up in a cloud into heaven. And then the two angels came and said, what are you looking into heaven for? The same Jesus who you saw go up into heaven will come down in like manner. And as we were singing that song, I was kind of picturing it. But the thing that stuck out to me this time as we were singing that is I said, this is this Jesus is mine. He's mine. You know, in the Song of Solomon, that statement that we get, my beloved is, he's my beloved and I'm his. To think of that this is my Jesus. The one that's going to come with a shout of an archangel with the trumpet sound. And nobody's going to miss it, but I can look and say, that's my Jesus. That's my Savior. Not everybody can say that at that time. <laughs> so praise the Lord for, for that. Anyway, let's uh, pray and we'll get into the Judges here, chapter 3. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your word. Again, we acknowledge your word is truth. And so we ask that you'd speak to us as we open it now. In your name we pray and make it applicable to our life. Thank you, Lord, that the things we read right now from the Old Testament were written for our admonition for our instruction. And we just thank you that it's inspired by you, that it will be a benefit to us today if we open up our hearts. I pray that you do that, Lord. Uh, we open up our hearts to you and ask, Lord, by the Holy Spirit, would your Holy Spirit minister to us? Would you teach us? If we open your word. I pray the same for myself, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Uh, turn to, we're going to cover the third chapter of Judges today. We've been going... I'm not going to repeat a lot of the introduction and all that like we did last week. But again, the thing you do have to keep in mind is there's seven cycles, sin cycles in the book. But even before we do that, I'm going to take a few minutes and, and just read something while you turn there. But it's from De uh, Deuteronomy chapter 32 and four, verse 4, and it says this about God. It says, He is the rock. His work is perfect. Okay, remember that. His work is perfect, and all his ways, not some of them, but all his ways are just. In other words, you can't find one thing that God's ever done and point your finger at it and say, this is unjust. <laughs> and then it says, a faithful God who does no wrong, upright, and just is he. And the reason I read that before we go into this, maybe you've said that before or heard, I've heard lots of people say that about God, that he's not a just God, he's not. But uh, this just reminds us that he is a rock, his work is perfect, all his ways are just, a faithful God who does no wrong, upright and just is he. That's a good reminder as we read through the scripture. Remember, this is our God. He doesn't make mistakes. Um, we, we live in a fallen world. I think we all understand that now. We live in a fallen world, and so in a fallen world, you have heartache. You have uh, things that don't go right, but the, there is such a thing called evil and good. And who sets that standard? We've been talking about it, but I think it's important to say God, God's the one who sets that standard of evil and good. And so we have to go, there is a moral standard. And that God has given it to us. And when we violate or break uh, that moral law, there are automatically consequences. I think from the very beginning you see that happen. Remember with Adam and Eve in the garden. You see that beginning there even. The day you eat of, that, of the tree, uh, you shall surely die. And then the devil comes and tells did God really say, you know, and kind of deceive them into this. And they took of the fruit and they suffered the consequences from it. And uh, then it was only their children. Think of this. Not even, the generation, they had children. And there was Cain and Abel. And in the very beginning, then, Cain uh, kills Abel. You have the first murder in the Bible. It was Adam and Eve who lived perfectly in a garden, but to see what their sin did, there's a moral standard. And when they broke it, there came consequences. And so into the world came violence and murder and every kind of evil you can possibly imagine. And so this is the world in which we live as well at, the, at this time. But because of that, there are moments of judgment. God says judgment. Bruce uh, was going through Joel chapter 3 today. Judgments. 
There's going to be the judgment, and Jesus talked about the judgments of the nations in Matthew. There's going to be the judgments uh, that come. And so, but there are judgment now. Uh, but part of this is the thing we call, uh, part of the judgment is suffering pain. We suffer pain. We suffer uh, grief as well. Again, but it was way back in the beginning that that happened. And so reminding ourselves that we live in a fallen world. And it isn't, and we can get upset about this and say, well, the Nazis killed 6 million Jews. It's a horrible thing. I'm not downplaying that at all. But volume of the amount of it doesn't, it's the fact that one, one person is murdered, you know, illegitimately. Ill, uh, one life is illegitimately taken. That's the real problem. And that's what happens when we reject God. And so when, it doesn't surprise me then that, that it multiplies up to 6 million. But who blamed for that? God always gets the blame in the world anyway, doesn't he? Who did it though? <laughs> Men did it. And yet we blame God for these things. But it's a consequence. And so it's that world that we, you and I live in called a fallen world. Um, and so there are consequences of these things. And so C.S. Lewis said this, there are two kinds of people in the world. Those who bend their knee to Christ, those who bow, bow their knee to God and they say, Lord, your will be done. And he says, and the, there's another group of people that won't bend their knee to God. And, they, and God says to them, okay, your will be done. Ah. So that's why we get what we have. It's, it's ultimately what, what Judges talks about. Um, every, this is a, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. You want what's right in your eyes? Have it. You can have it. And that's why you see what we see. And in the world today too. Uh, God can cause a flood. Is part of the judgment, and this happened. All our kids, we teach them this story from a young age, tell them about the flood in Noah's day. When you think of it, we're, we're telling them about this story where God killed every living thing in this world except eight people, you know, and, and, and starts over basically with the them. But God did the judgment. And so now when we come to the book of Judges, you might be asking yourself, why, why is there so much killing and so on? And we have the story of David and Goliath. It's one of the first probably stories you've heard in, in, uh, in Sunday school and so on. But when you think of it, we're, we're telling our kids about some little guy who went out and killed this huge giant of a man. And we tell how God gave him the victory and stuff. But then when we think about it, we're, we're actually telling him a story of, of, you know, a killing that a little boy did to another man or something. And is it murder then? Is it, you know, and, and things can be brought up in this. And, but that's why I want to clarify a few things as we begin this. Um, that uh, sometimes the fact is God will take judgment into his own hand like he did in the flood. And he just, he saw the heart of man was wicked continually. But by grace, he saved Noah. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And God spared him. But then the thing, here's what gets us. Is that God will use sinful people to judge other sinful people. And this is kind of where we find ourselves maybe in a quandary sometimes. Why does God do it? Why does he use the nation of Israel to judge the Canaanites? Why does God use the Babylonians to judge Israel? See, it happens on both sides, not, not just that God's people, Israel, don't suffer too. They, they suffer for their sin. And But I want to point out a few things here before we go uh, God had commanded Joshua to slaughter uh, and to kill and to annihilate there. But the moral question is, is it right thing to do? You know, is it the right thing to do? Or in the Ten Commandments we have, you shall not murder. And then there's commanded to go out and kill and so on. Uh, but the point is that in this period of history, there is a time uh, or God is the immediate king over his people, Israel. They're a nation now. They're a nation. Um, and he uses his people to accomplish his judgments in the world at that time. Uh, in other words, God had said to the Amalekites, or to, to keep, keep your place here, and let's go to, let me see if I wrote it down. Yeah, Genesis chapter 15. We are going way back to the beginning, okay? Genesis chapter 15. The Amalek, what I'm saying is, these, uh, the children of Israel are going to take over a land. And it didn't just start here where God says, okay, um, let's see, where do I want to put you in the world? Yeah, Abraham, uh, I promised him this land. We're going to give you this land. So all the people who just happened to be moving in here, 
I don't, let's kill them, get them out of here. This is your land, you're going to have it. It wasn't that way. Here's what happens. Abraham hasn't even had a son yet. He doesn't have a child. And God tells him about the future 400 years out. In Genesis chapter 15 and verse 12, we'll begin at verse 12. And here's what he says. Now when the sun was going down and a deep sleep fell upon Abram, his name hasn't you changed yet, and behold, a horror and great darkness fell upon him. Then he said to Abram, know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs and will serve them and they will afflict them 400 years. So this is, this is, he's talking about Egypt here. All right. He doesn't even have children yet. And he's telling them what's going to happen. Your descendants are going to go in the land. I mean, this is kind of scary for to hear about. If it was my descendants, you know, they're going to be you know, afflicted for 400 years and so on. But then he says in verse 14, and also the nations whom they serve, I will judge. Bruce talked about that this morning, Joel chapter 3. Afterwards, they shall come out with great possessions. That's how they left Egypt, remember? They just, God let them have everything they had. They walked out of there rich. Verse 15. Now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation, they shall return here. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. All right. So there's a people living in the land. Abraham is there now and God promising 400 years and four generations to come. Your descendants are going to leave Egypt. They're going to come and this land is going to become theirs. And the reason it's not theirs yet is he says the Amorites are the people living in there with the Canaanites and others. He says their iniquity is not yet full. In other words, I always picture it in a cup. It's only got this much iniquity in it yet. I'm waiting until it gets to here. And just like the flood, I, I have judgment is coming. You know what I see in the 400 years though? I see what I see in the book of Revelation. God gave them space to repent and they didn't repent. This is the mercy of God. Did he not say that to Nineveh? He didn't offer mercy to Nineveh, did he? God never offered mercy. He said, I'm going to destroy the city in 40 days. They repented. They put their faith in this one who, who would come. And what did God do? He relented. He received them. And that's why I think he did that. But see, it doesn't that he just hated these people. He said, they, I mean, by the time the Israelites came in, they, they were killing their kids, burning their children in a fire, live. And they didn't kill them first. They, they burned their children to a god, Molech, and so on. And then to make it worse, the children of Israel eventually did the same thing. But you see why when he comes to the, he didn't just annihilate these people. And that's why, you know, Dawkins and others have saying, you know, it just the God of the Old Testament, he's a, you know, he encourages genocide and uh, forget racial, what do they call it, cleansing. Hey, it's not at all like that. No, God is dealing with sin. He's not dealing with ethnic groups. He's dealing with their sin. He's dealing with Israel's sin. He deals with everybody's sin. And don't think you'll get away with your sin or my sin. God, one thing God doesn't tolerate, you find in the Bible, sin. And he, he's never liked it, never will. In fact, you look at the cross and see what he thinks of sin. If you want to see what God thinks of us uh, and how to punish it and take care of it and so on. So uh, there was a period of time where he, he did this. But to today, God has given the government the sword. You understand that? He's given, the government takes care now of, and that's what he says, they don't carry the sword in vain, Paul's writing to the Romans, right? Telling them the government now has the right to punish sin. It's not something I take or the church takes into their hands now and says, we'll continue to handle this. There was a period of time where God was directly over them. And they, they, as a nation, a nation needs a military. In the fallen world, if our nation didn't have a military, how would we defend it? Can you imagine no police force out there? Chaos would erupt. And so I thank God for men and women who serve in our military, for military, uh, for the, the state troopers and those that are out there putting their life on the line because of nuts out there like me and you, right? We need, we need uh, that. And so God has given us uh, as a nation and Israel as a nation had to have an army. Uh, and so we thank God for that. But the church today is not Israel. And uh, we're not a political entity. And therefore, the word of the Lord to us is love your enemies. 
Whoa. Love your enemies. Do good to them who despitefully use you. And so on. And, and give up your life in the spread of the gospel. He doesn't say go out and kill people and convert them. <laughs> you know, kill them if they don't convert. <laughs> That's what the, some of the Muslims are trying to do. That is a takeover. But God's spirit is like, give up your life in sharing the gospel. Give up your life for my sake. And see, that's so I hope we understand that when we read about all these killings, how can it be? You know, this was a period and God was dealing with a nation. A nation has to have a military force. And 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 the other people, again, the reminders, the Malachites just reach to God and says, I, I just can't take it anymore. And and you're gonna be out. Your judgment is coming. And he used his own nation to, to accomplish that. But remember, he used the Babylonians, the Syrians to use it against his own people. So it doesn't matter where sin is found. God will deal with it. So remember, these things are written, again, for our admonition and so on. But remember, the, the main feature in this whole book from Genesis to Revelation is the love of God. You say you don't see love in the Old Testament. My goodness. Uh, Bruce just did Hosea and Gomer. Man, if you don't understand the love of God after reading the book of Hosea, uh, a prostitute, my goodness, who sold herself to others, gave and the husband comes back and he has to buy her back. Tell us about the love of God for you and me. And then in the last book in Malachi, he starts off the book by saying, I've loved you. Is it? It's love. Love in the Old Testament. I've loved you with everlasting arms, it says earlier on. But at the end of the New Testament, Old Testament, it says, I've loved you. And, you have, and yet you say to me, wherein have you loved us? We don't get it. We miss it. It's there, and the love of God is girded through the whole Old and New Testament. It's the same God, same, same purpose, and these things are written for our admonition. And so with that kind of, a, I know it's a long introduction, but I figure I know sometimes we can get confused with some of this, these issues. And so think of it this way, and if the kids maybe can think of it this way too, as we go through, it's going to be David and Goliath over and over again. Uh, God's going to use his people to deliver, and he's going to use strange ways and and funny things to happen to, to do that. We're going to get into that today. Um, let's read the first four verses now. And uh, I assume you read it uh, before coming today. So I'm going to maybe skip some parts a little bit. But now these are the nations which the Lord left. And we kind of went this the first in the introduction. So I'm not going to go along on it. Now, therefore, all the nations which the Lord left, uh, that they might test Israel by them, and that all who had known any of the wa uh, wars in Canaan. This was only so that the generations of the children of Israel might be taught to know war. There we have what we just talked about. They might be taught to know war. For those who had not formerly known it, namely uh, the five lords of the Philistines, he said the Canaanites, the Sidonians, and so on and so forth, verse 4, and they were, they were left that he might test Israel by them. To know whether they would obey the command of the Lord, which he commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. So there's purpose in all of all of what God did. In the first four verses, we say that why did he leave these nations there? One thing, to test his people. Number two, to discipline his people, his sinful people, to discipline them. And, and, and the third reason we see here in this verse, in this section is here, that they might learn the art of war. Okay. You had to know it. Um, and then verse uh, 5. Uh, see again, thus the children of Israel dwelt among the Canaanites. A sad, sad thing when they were to cast them out. And I won't go into that. Verse 6. And they took their daughters to be their wives. And they gave their daughters to their sons. And they served their gods. Exactly what he said would happen if you do that. Don't give your daughters. Don't be unequally yoked and so on. And so here in verse 7, we see the beginning. Here's the first cycle, that sin cycle, remember? Here's the first one, and here's the first and how it happened here. So the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and the Ashtaroths. Therefore, the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. And he sold them into the hand of Cushan uh, Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia. And the children of Israel served Cushan Rishathaim eight years. When the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the children of Israel who delivered them. Othniel, or Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. 
the spirit of the Lord came upon him and he judged the people uh, or he judged Israel and he went out to war and the Lord delivered Kishan Reshathayim, king of Mesopotamia into his hand and the hand his hand prevailed against Kushan Rishathaim. So the hand, so the land had rest 40 years. Then Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. And there we have the first. It's very brief, not much detail at all. Uh, but here you have a statement of the, one of the first judges. And we'll go back, just look at just a little bit here. Uh, again, the, the anger of the Lord was hot. God's never happy with sins. You know God does get angry, right? <laughs> He does get angry. He's merciful. And he's, but remember this, the Old Testament and New tell us that Jesus, that God is slow to anger. Okay? But he does get angry. And so they had, here begins that sin cycle. They forgot God. They served the Baals. Um, and so God raises up uh, Kush, uh, Kushan, Rishathaim, and that his name actually means the double, he had like a nickname, no, the doubly wicked, Kushan. It was like he had earned this reputation for being a doubly wicked. And that's, I guess, what his name means, doubly wicked. He was an evil person, yet, and he'd taken control. And why? The reason he got to do that was because of Israel, right? Uh, where does it say that? Uh, the Lord, okay, in verse eight, therefore the anger of the Lord was kindled, was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of Cushan Reshtayim of Mesopotamia, and that's where uh, Abram came from anyway, right? So way out, not in this territory, but quite a ways out in the northern Iraq today, or Iran, is it? And uh, so this is the area where he's coming from, and Israel served him, you know, eight years, eight years. He sold them. This, this. Um, Statement is found several uh, all through here. He sold them. What's that mean? He sold them. He, it's it's like a commercial use. They, it, giving a possession to somebody else. He sold them. Uh, there was another place in Deuteronomy. It says they one shall chase a thousand and two shall chase ten thousand. Uh, and how could they do it unless the Lord sold them? Unless the Lord's holy. So it doesn't, it, God doesn't need a big army to do it. He could just use a few people to, to, to do it. But they fall into the same trap. In verse 9, and they cried out to the Lord. This is amazing to me is that they waited eight years. You know, they're, they're serving this king. Okay, you want to serve their gods? You can serve their king then. You don't want to serve me? And they maybe cried to the Baals for a long time, maybe for eight years. I don't know. But they were mistreated. Whatever the point came from, finally they turned to the Lord. Maybe it took them eight years. And they finally turned to the Lord. And what's the Lord do? And it just simply makes a statement, verse 9, then they cried to the Lord and he raised up for them a deliverer. Othniel, the, Kenez, uh, uh, the son of Kenes, Caleb's younger brother, who saved them. Hmm. Uh, remember he was back in, the, he's the first judge, but remember he was back in chapter 1, if you want to look in verse 12 and 13. Judges 1, 12, and 13. And Caleb said, Whoever attacks Kiriath Sefer and takes it, to him I will give my daughter uh, Aksa as wife. Uh, and they did this quite a bit back then, too. You know, you take this city, I'll give you my wife. Who was the first one to stand up? One of his relatives. That's what I like about Caleb and his family. They just seem to, God promises his territory. I talked about that last week. His daughter asked, You can have it. Take it. Now here's, here's a place to possess, something to, to conquer. And Caleb offers it. Oh, who's going to, any man out there who wants to go and take, I'll, I'll give you my daughter. I don't know if he knew her before and says, oh, she's hot. I want her or whatever. But he, he said, hey, I'll fight this battle. Why? Because he trusted God. And he did it. And he got, he got her as, as a wife. So back in the beginning, you see the heart of him. And I think what we'll see gradually, and I've said this before, is that it seems like they're going downhill little by little. And these first judges seem, if, if there's any good judges in this book that are to be looked at as a better example than others, it would be these first three. We're going to look at three today. And then gradually you see them kind of decline a little bit until you get to Samson. You're just shaking your head. And say, God use that guy. <laughs> look at the immoral life he's living. And so on and so forth. 
But you kind of see they're, they're, things are still kind of fresh in their eyes a little bit. They, they did sin, but they're completing this cycle. And it seemed that they cried out to the Lord. Second, you know, not all the times as we go through this cycle are you going to see that where they cried to the Lord, at least in the book of Judges. But Samuel refers to that time and he seems to talk about it, saying, implying that it seemed like every time that was the thing that happened. Samuel refers to it. We can look at it. I'll just give you the scripture. We won't look it up now. But 1 Samuel 12, 9 to 11. He implies that uh, the people confessed their sins to each other on, on every occasion and cried to the Lord and he delivered them. So even if it's not stated in the book, when Samuel talks about it later on, he implies that this is what happened and that's what the cycle is and God delivers. Then in answer to prayer. Um, aren't you glad God does this? And he raised up a deliverer. And in this case, Othniel, or however you say his name. And then verse 10 and 11. The Spirit of the Lord came on him, upon him so that he became Israel's judge and went to war. The, the Lord gave Kushan Rithashayim, king of Aram, into the hands of Othniel. He overpowered him. Why did he do it? The Spirit of God came upon him. Actually, the word for it is literally clothed him. Like I'm clothed in this. The Spirit of God clothed him. Isn't that good? Be clothed with the Spirit of God. Comes upon him. And God's power gave him. How could he do it? That's how he could do it. God was with him. God was clothing him, as it were. And he gave that king after eight years into his hands. And, and the thing you'll notice about him compared to Sam, uh, even other judges that we're going to look at, is he decisive immediately does it. It's it just says he, he went out, God empowered him, no questions asked. You know, he's not saying, oh, show me a sign, right? I'm not exactly sure. I think you want me to have this land, but uh, wavering a little bit. He's not like Samson having parties with the enemy, you know. Things like, you just, a matter of stat, uh, fact statements here. Uh, God clothed him, he was obedient, went and took it, and God gave it to him. And so it's a neat, neat thing, uh, quite, a, quite an example. And in verse 11, so the, hand, the land had peace 40 years, and you'll see that throughout the book. It doesn't always tell how long, but eight years into, into slavery with this king, and they cry out to the Lord. And you'll see this repeated, and this gives me encouragement. I don't know about you, but when we fall or something, and call out to God, God hears, and he answers, and he sends a deliverer. And now it's had peace or rest for 40 years. 40 years rest. So see, as remember, 350 to 400 years passed by in this. We're going to read this account and go fast. We'll say, wow, well, they're stupid. They kept going again into this cycle and cycle. Yeah, yeah, but you have to remember, time passed. And, and these things happened. And so 40 years of rest. And you think, okay, they've learned their lesson, and we've learned ours too, right? Well, now starts the second judge, in the second cycle. Uh, Othniel's dead, Joshua's dead. It starts the book by saying Joshua died. Caleb's now dead. Othniel, the first judge, he's dead. And so what happens in verse 12? We'll begin to read it there of chapter 3. And the children of Israel again, notice that, again. The children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. So what's happened? Here's the start of the cycle again. So the Lord strengthened Eglon, king of Moab, against Israel. And again, because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. What was the reason? Why did God take them over? Again, he just makes it, states it, because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. Um, sin, here's something we have to learn, too, if we haven't figured it out yet. Sin always brings bondage. Sin will always bring bondage. Don't, I mean, the devil has to, you see, we'll use the analogy of a fish hook. For those of us who have done some fishing, you have that hook there. That, that hook is deceptive. I mean, it's rare, yeah, you can catch a fish with it, uh, a bear hook, but, it, but generally you need a bait. And the enemy knows that, the devil knows that. And so when he tempts us to sin, he makes things look good to us. Appealing, something that affects our senses, and we say, Oh, that, that looks so good. That's so tempting, we say. Not realizing that underneath is a hook. And as soon as we bite into it, that hook takes place, and boom, and we're caught. 
And that's how the devil will use it too. You can do it with drugs. You can do it with all manner of things. Lying, you know, you, you tell a lie to somebody and then you have to cover it up with another lie and pretty soon you're, you got this big concocted story and if you're found out, you you know, you'd be known as the liar, but it, it's, it's a hook that comes and all of a sudden you're entrenched by it. And so remember that. You see that throughout the book of Judges that every, sin always brings bondage. And it does it to you and me. Don't think it won't, it won't happen to you or me. Uh, it might not come in this way when we're sown to foreign kings or something, but something will happen in our life and we'll be in bondage to that thing. And so sin <clears throat> has that effect. And God says it was because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord that he gave them to Eglon, the king of Moab. Then he gathered himself uh, to the people of Ammon and Amalek. So he, he's rounding up an army, king of Moab, and he's talking to the other people that live around him and say, hey, we have a common enemy here. Let's join together. So he gets uh, Ammon and Amalek together in their groups. Uh, <clears throat> they went and they defeated Israel and took possession of the city of Palms. Uh, Jericho, most people think, around or uh, city there after it was destroyed. So the children of Israel served Eglon, a king of Moab, 18 years. Now they're in bondage for a longer time, 18 years. And they're dealing with Amalek now because they hadn't dealt with him earlier. They were told to wipe out the Amalekites. They didn't do it. And now here they're facing them as an enemy again. But when the children of Israel, so 18 years go by, and when the children of Israel cried to the Lord, the Lord raised up deliverers for them. Ehud, I'm going to call him. I don't know how it's pronounced. Ehud, the son of Gera, the Benjamite, a left-handed man. Anybody left-handed here today? Hey, you got some left-handed people. Yeah, there we go. One to three at least. Wow. They're all on the right side. My right side. They're left. Okay, it's fair. God can even use left-handed people. Look at this. Watch this. I had a brother who was left-handed. You know how... We, we played ping pong. There was a period of time where we played ping pong, a lot of ping pong. And uh, so you curve that ball and you get used to it. Isn't it? And then my brother, Steve, comes along and he's left-handed, unfortunately. And so everything off his paddle was opposite what we were used to hitting. And he'd win and I'd say, oh, I can't control that spin. Can't, can't counter that spin. It's a totally different thing coming from a left-handed person. And you see it coming and you think you know how to react and you do it wrong. And so I don't know, it, it's not necessarily, uh, in, in this story, this come, becomes a really good thing, all right? Because most people were right-handed, and it's funny that he was a Benjamite because Benjamin means son, son of my right hand, and he was left-handed. But uh, I, look at this, he says, he, he raised up a deliverer named Ehud, the son of Gareth, a Benjamite, a left-handed man. By him, the children of Israel sent tribute to Eglon, the king of Moab. So generally what happened when you were, another country conquered you and, and Israel did the same thing. Okay, we need tribute from you. You, uh, we, you owe us taxes. We want so much of your grain every year. We want so much of your cattle or so many gold, this much gold. And you've got to make sure that you go back to your country, collect that tax because maybe once a year or so, we're going to demand that of you. And you better bring it to us. And so that's apparently what happened in Israel. They had to bring tribute to this king, you know, under him 18 years. And uh, Ehud had had a, a, about enough of King Eglon, you know, and God raised him up, don't forget. And so he's a left-handed guy and he's thinking, ah, I got to take uh, tribute to the king. And he schemes his plan. I don't know how he does it. He says, this is going to be the day that God gives victory over the enemies. And so it's going to be the day that I bring him his tribute. What I owe him as a nation of Israel, we owe him tribute. So I'm going to take all this gold or silver or things that we're going. He brought a, a group of people with him to carry it. And they come before him, the king, and present this gift to him. And so that they can live another year, you know, and go collect their taxes again. And oh, so by him, the children of Israel sent tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Now Ehud made himself a dagger. He made one. Made himself a little, little sword-like, a dagger, sharp on both ends. And, and what I, I noticed that I never really noticed before is in this book you have tools that were used that were strange tools for battle. 
And I don't know if it's fully that they didn't have enough swords. I know by the time you get to Samuel, only in, in, in uh, Saul's day, only Saul and, Saul and his son Jonathan had a sword. Nobody else had swords. And we'll, t we'll look at that in a little bit here. But anyway, um, and so he made this dagger and it was a double-edged, uh, a cubit in length. Uh, he fastened it under his clothes on his right thigh. And see, this is key. If you're left-handed, you're going to put your sheath and your sword, right? Daniel probably knows this. He's got stuff like this. And, and uh, you, you, you do it so you can pull it out this way, right? And it'd be hard to go out like this and kind of turn your arm funny to get a sword out. So they place them on this side. If you're left-handed, you'd be reaching your right thigh and pull it out. Well, evidently, they came through security, I'm sure, of some sort, probably, to enter the king's palace like that. But they probably just felt his left side, you know. Oh, he doesn't have a sword. This guy's good. You know, let him in. Bring the tribute in. So he manages to sneak it past security simply, I believe, because he was left-handed. And this is why God can use left-handed people. And he has it on the right side and makes through there presenting his gifts to the gifts to him. So he's telling us a little bit of the detail. A little more than the last story. Notice the last story didn't give us any detail. He just went and he took it. He was their king, judge, he died, and so on. The Eglon gives us a lot more. Uh, or in Ehud there here. So he brought a tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Now, um, Eglon was a very fat man. Sorry, excuse me for my in political, the Bible's in uh, politically correct language. He was a fat man. I think but over 18 years, he may have been a mighty warrior before that, but over 18 years he was living a posh life. He was king, and I kind of think tend to think he, he got a little fat in those times and, and wasn't the warrior that he was before. And then verse 18. And when he'd finished presenting the tribute, he sent away the people who had carried the tribute. So Eglon looks at his people that brought this. He says, okay, you can leave now. I'll, I'll stay back just a little bit longer. And then verse 19. But he himself turned back from the stone images and that were in uh, Gilgal and said, I have a secret message for you, O king. He said, uh, he said, uh, keep silence. And all who attended him went out from him. So he comes back to the king and said, listen, I have a message from God for you. Uh, and, and Ehud, is, I suppose, uh, or Eglon, uh, gained confidence. He said, well, he brought me the tribute. I want to hear what, what this guy has to say to me about it. what message he has from God. So he told the people to be quiet, and he sends his people out. So now you got two people left, the king and uh, God's deliverer. <clears throat> and in verse 20, so Ehud came to him. Now he was sitting upstairs in his cool private chambers. <clears throat> then Ehud said, I have a message from God for you. So he arose from his seat. When Ehud reached, when Ehud reached with his left hand, took the dagger from his right thigh and thrust it into his belly. Even the, uh, even the hilt went after the blade, and the fat closed over the blade. Uh, for he did not uh, draw the dagger out of his belly, and his entrails came out. Then Ehud went out through the porch and shut the doors of the upper room behind him and locked them. And when he'd gone out, Eglon's servants came to look, and, they were, and to their surprise, the doors were, of the upper room were locked. So they said, he is probably attending to his needs in the cool chamber. All right, use your imagination there. Eh? So they waited till they were embarrassed, and still he didn't open the doors of the upper room. Therefore they took a key and opened them, and there was their, their master fallen dead on the floor. But Ehud had escaped while they delayed, and passed beyond the stone images and escaped to uh, Sira. So you see what happened. He's, he took care of business. He delivered. He took this king. It's kind of like David and Goliath situation. And where he escapes, leaves the door locked, and I gave him enough time while they waited for their king. And finally, to their embarrassment, they finally opened the key with the door. He escaped some back way and got out of there. And it says that he escaped. Um, in verse 27. And it happened when he arrived that he blew the trumpet in the, mount of, uh, in the mountains of Ephraim. And the children of Israel went down with him from the mountain, and he led them. Here's their new deliverer that got in. He, 
He took care of their king. And the first thing he does when he goes home is blows a trumpet. Let's, let's call the guys for war. And he did it for, with Ephraim. He said, come on, let's fight. And there in verse 28, then he said to them, follow me for the Lord has delivered his enemy, the, your enemies, the Moabites, into your hand. It's a done deal. It, he says it's a done deal. The Lord has delivered. They haven't even fought yet. And you see the faith of, of the second judge Ehud in this story? The faith that he had, that he trusted God. Look, God just gave me the king. Now he's rounding up the people. He says, come on, the Lord's delivered them. He has. It's already done. It's a done deal. And isn't that the way we should look at the promises of God? It's a done deal. God said it. It's going to happen. Let's believe it. And so he rounds them up. And um, for Moabites in your hand. So they went down after him, seized the fords of the Jordan leading to Moab. So they blocked off any any place where they could go back to Moab. And they did not allow anybody, anyone to cross. And at that time, they killed also about, or they killed about 10,000 men of Moab. All stout men of valor. Stout men of valor. All, should we say giants? As they just say, should we get the point? He's just saying, they clean out 10,000. And then look at this. Not a man escaped. Not a man escaped. No one escaped. And yet you just read in verse 26 that Ehud had escaped while they delayed. He escaped, but 10,000 of them did. And not a man. So Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel. And the land had rest for 80 years. Not 40 this time, twice as long. 80 years. No, no more white fighting, at least for the, for the most part. They were, their land had rest and they were again in, in charge. I believe they began to serve the Lord God of Israel. But again, we'll see the cycle next chapter change a little bit. So that's the second judge. And now what we have, these are uh, what we call major judges. Now we're going to get to a minor judge and he takes up one verse. Just one verse about his life, uh, but he's in the Bible, isn't this? Neat? He's before us to read, and it's, his name is Shamgar. Look at verse 31, the last one. After him was Shamgar, the son of Anath, who killed 600 men of the Philistines with an ox goad, and he also delivered Israel. Boom, that's all it says. That's why we say he's a minor judge. There's, there's not a lot of information, it just states a thing about him that he killed 600 Philistines. And it's, it, it, says, uh, it says after him, so after Ehud. In those 80 year period, apparently, and before Deborah came, Deborah will be the next judge. We look at a, a, a lady, as it were, that God raised up as a judge, a woman. And But he, he uses all kinds of people here. And here he uses Shamgar, the son of Anath. And some people say that's not even an Israel, Israelite name. And, I'm not going to read much into it or anything, but just God uses people to deliver them too. And so this is the third, it's kind of just a snapshot. Uh, an ox goad, and I, I looked this up to find out what an ox goad was. And it's, it's about a, a pole or a stick, uh, it's about six inches round and about eight feet long. And on one end, it was had a sharp metal uh, prod that you kind of prod the oxen with. Kind of help them steer you where you want. They're big animals. And it had this metal, sharp metal thing on it. You could prod them with this stick and, and get them going. And on the other end was kind of a hooked sickle-like thing, a little bit like that, a piece of metal kind of sharp. And they used that to clean off their plows with. They would take that and clean off the plows with on, on the end of the plow. And so they had this thing they could use for the animals, clean the plow. And this guy goes out with this as his weapon. I mean, first of all, isn't it the first one who who took this uh, uh, dagger that he made and he cleaned the enemy out with that thing. And now he's got, he got somewhere along there where he goes against the Philistine and kills 600 men at one. Kind of like a Rambo, right? You think, oh, that's just fake stuff. <laughs> John, I think, brought that to my attention. I always oh, laugh at that and stuff. But what about these guys? 600 Philistines. Did he do it in one shot? I don't know. It doesn't tell us here, but hey. Stranger things have happened. 600. And he delivered and was a judge somewhere in this period here. So it's kind of neat how uh, God will take uh, whatever we have. 
and use it. Uh, remember what he said to Moses? Moses was a shepherd, right? And he had this shepherd staff in his hand. God says, Moses, what's that in your hand? You know, I love the way God had. What's that in your hand, Moses? Staff? <laughs> the right answer? God says, give it to me. I'm going to use it. Throw it down. You tell them what to do with it. Turn it into a snake. He says, I'm going to use it. David, David, it's almost you could say the same thing. King David, when he was a little boy, David, what's that in your hand? Oh, it's a sling. Let me use it. What do you have? He, God, we always think, if I had the latest weapon, I could really do something for God. Yeah. Uh, what do we need? To, and I remember this uh, pastor in Macedonia always say that. I wish, you know, oh, if Dan would just give us money, what we could accomplish here in Macedonia, you know. Uh, why aren't you doing it? You need money. You think money's going to answer? Use what you have, right? And you just use. If you have you have a bicycle, why don't you go with a bicycle? We did the first four or five years in Germany. That's all we had: bicycles. Got around everyone bicycles, and it's work. And you can do it. And David, what's that sling? Man, I can just imagine Shamgar. Shamgar, what, what's that in your hand there? Oh, an ox goad. I got some ox in here. Well, I want you to clean house on some of them Philistines there. Take care of those enemies. And he goes out and fights. 600. 600 of them. What can God do with a person who just avails himself to God or a woman with just what we have? You say it's not much. God doesn't need much, does he? How, many, how much do he use the little boy's food to feed a, a multitude? Just a few fish and the loaves of bread. Jesus, give it to me. See, the thing happens is when we give it to him, doesn't it? It multiplies. Things happen. We keep it to ourselves and use it for our purpose. Well, God, here, here's, I don't have much, but I give it to you. Use me. And he uses it. Later on, you'll see, next week, what did she use? A tent peg. What did Samson use? Jawbone of a donkey. A lady from up here, we'll read about her. She threw, what did she throw out the window? A millstone. What do you say? These aren't, these aren't weapons. These aren't weapons. And I have to read a little bit of chapter 5. It's kind of the song of Deborah because she refers to Shamgar in her song. So I want you to turn to the fifth chapter just briefly here. In verse 6, to show you a little bit what things were like under the enemy, too, a little bit. In verse 6, Judges 5, 6, this is her, her song after her victory, but we're just going to look at this short section. In the days of Shamgar, son of Anna, so it's the same one. In the days of Jael, that's the one we'll read about next week. The, highs, the highways were deserted, and the travelers walked along the byways. Things were bad. You didn't take the main high. I'm too dangerous if you were an Israelite. You didn't want to be found there. And so the song says, the highways were deserted and the travelers walked along the byways. Village life ceased. It ceased in Israel until I, Deborah, arose, arose a mother in Israel. And that we'll look at. I have to wait till next week. But verse 8 says, they chose new gods. Then there was war in their gates. Not a shield or a spear was seen among the 40,000 in Israel. How are we supposed to defend ourselves? <laughs> we don't have a sword here. We can't walk the main ways. Uh, Shamgar said, well, I'm going to clear that highway. In the days of Shamgar, this is the way things were. You didn't travel on the main highway. You took other ways if you were an Israelite. And Shamgar said, well, not me. I'm going to judge. I'm going to take care of these things. And Deborah said the same thing. But they didn't have a sword or a shield in 40,000 in Israel. And what are we going to do? I'll use an ox goat. <laughs> I'll use whatever you have to clean out the enemy. And again, now we've looked at three judges in this short chapter. And there are, you know, in this book, 12 of them. And some take a little longer to, to talk about and so on. But the real hero, hero is not Othniel or Othniel. It's not Ehud or Shamgar. Again, I'll remind you this. The real hero of the book is God. Because this is the part that gets me that I've been going through this. It says, who, who hears their groans? 
Was it any of the judges who hears their groans? No, it says God heard their cries. He feels, and we've read this in another place, he feels, who feels pity for them? God does. God feels pity for them. Who provides a deliverer? God does. And who achieves deliverance? God does. But he uses people. And that's why I think of this. There are people you and I know who are in bondage today. Bondage to sin. And God wants to send deliverers to them. Will we present the gospel to these people? Will we present the gospel to them so that they can be delivered from their sin? Again, we're not the heroes, are we? We're just the instrument, the imperfect as we are. Because you'll find here, God uses, God uses people who are far from perfect. But who he uses, he empowers. Clothes them with his spirit. And they do phenomenal things. <laughs> Phenomenal things. Let me just maybe summarize here. Again, and two, God's the real hero, but another thing I have to emphasize again is not uh, the Moabites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, they're not the real enemy. They're instruments of God's discipline. Yes. The real enemy was sin in me and sin in you. Because it all starts with that. Remember? He said, because you sinned, because you did evil in the sight of the Lord, I'm going to send Eglon, the king, and he's going to have charge over you. And they were in bondage. And so the real issue here is not the enemy out there, it's the sin in you and me. And God wants us to, I think, isn't, there, isn't it great that God offers deliverance from that? Deliverance from the bondages of sin? Jesus set people free from demon possession. My goodness. He's still setting people free today from sin and its power. And so I would just say today, what do we how do we liken it today? Most of our battles are not physical against the enemy. The, the Bible and Ephesians talks about our warfare is spiritual. We fight against forces that are just as real, they're actually more real and bigger. They're more than a match for me. Just like you said, I'm gonna send you to a nation that are seven nations. Bigger and stronger than you. You can't conquer them on your own. But with me, see, these enemies seem so strong, but God can just as quickly, just like that, wipe them out. They're no problem to him at all. And so he does. So today, the spirit, it's spiritual battle against uh, forces of wickedness in heavenly places and high places and so on. But if we're to that point where, how do we make this applicable in many ways? I, I kind of found it hard to, how do I close but I just say this, if we're struggling with sin, if we're trying to cry out to God, right? over and over again, don't think, and the devil will tell you this, uh, when you sin or something, you do something wrong. And I've experienced, this is why I know I'm speaking from experience too. Some of the thought will come to my mind, or the devil will speak to me, however you want to say it, and say, Dan, don't talk to God about it now. You, it's fresh. You just did it. My goodness. Have some time for repentance here. Have some time of sorrow. Have have some time of, you know, don't talk to God about it now. He doesn't want to hear from you right now. You just messed up big time. Go go, take care of something else. But don't, you know, that's a lie. Take care of it now. Take care of it now. The devil will lie to you. You're not worthy. You come to him. Don't, why, why wait eight years? Why wait 18 years? Before you start calling out to God. Why not call today? Today is the day of salvation. Jesus. The Bible says. Today. Is the day of salvation. Tomorrow no guarantee. I don't know. But today is the day to get right with God. Today is the day to get victory over sin. It starts with calling out on the, upon the name of the Lord. Leave your bail or anything you looked before. If you're gone. If there's people in here. Perhaps there are. I don't know. Who are looking to, to the horoscope. Or something else in your future. Stop doing it. It's wrong. It's sinful. God forbids it and other stuff. Don't look to, when are you going to turn to the Lord? He's the one who can deliver you. And he wants to deliver you. And all you have to do is ask, repent and turn over your sins. I love this verse in James. It's been encouragement to me these last few months. Is draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. Is that a promise? I take it as it is. So that if I draw near to God, he will draw near to me. Cry out to him. In the Lord's Prayer, what are we taught to pray? Forgive us our trespasses. Why? <laughs> I mess up. I sin. Zoe says, when you come before me, one of the things I want to include in your prayers, 
Father, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass. He's I yell others too. But then he says, and deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord. What's he saying? I want to deliver you. I want this to be part of your prayer daily. Come before me and say, deliver me from this. You struggle with certain things in your life. I have to pray, God, deliver me from this. And I believe and I know and I've seen it in my own life. God delivers us. There are things that used to tempt me that to this day are have some, don't really even tempt me anymore like it used to. And what can I say then? Oh, well, I've gotten older and wiser, you know, and I've learned a few things in my lifetime. No, it's that God has delivered me from it. If I take any of the credit, it's just the flesh. And you can't fight, fight the flesh with flesh. It takes the Spirit of God. And so, if there are things we're battling, ask him, come before him now. Let's just spend one minute in prayer. If God has any brought anything to your attention, you cry out to him right now and ask him for deliverance. And then believe in it to be true and start acting on the promise. Be like these first three judges who didn't ask any questions. They just said, okay, God, you said it, you give it, I take it. Let's pray. Just a moment of silence. Oh, Jesus, our ultimate deliverance came at a great cost to you on the cross where you paid for my sin. Thank you for that. Thank you that I don't have to live a defeated life, but through the power of the Holy Spirit living within me. Conquer the flesh in me, Lord. Conquer the sin in my life. Pray we would not wait to call out to you but as soon as we sin and we realize it, Lord, we make it right. We ask you forgiveness. That there can be immediate deliverance, and not years in bondage. And so we call out to the God who pities us. The God who has mercy. The God who has no obligatory reason why he has to do it. Other than your mercy and your goodness, Lord. All your ways are just. All your ways are here. Your ways are perfect. A God of faithfulness, without injustice, good and upright is he. So we thank you, Lord, for that, that you show yourself that way, that you demonstrate to a world that you are that kind of a God. And so, Lord, even when I don't understand it, I have to just admit your ways are just. And I love you, Lord. Thank you for delivering me. Continue to be my deliverer until final deliverance comes. <laughs> the other side of this grave, Lord. In the meantime, help us to fight. Help us to be like Caleb and Joshua who just took the land. Lord, every blessing that belongs to us in Christ Jesus in heavenly places, help us to take advantage of that. Set before us the promises of God. Help us to live in them, trust in you by faith. So help us to walk this life, Lord. And today I just pray you would help us. Help us to walk this life that we can't do it on our own. I thank you that you will empower us. And so, Lord, we ask for your help. We need you as our deliverer. And, Lord, we offer us ourselves up to, like the judges, Lord, who we don't have much or whatever we do have, Lord. We want to see it used for your purposes, Lord, for our children. We want to see our children used by you, Lord. We want to see our children go up to serve you. We want to see a lot of great things, Lord. And so we ask that you use us. Help us to believe your word. Forgive us for our our doubting hearts sometimes. Even Thomas, Lord, in his doubt, you came. You said, all right, you want to put your hand in my side? You put it right here. You see me. I'm alive. Lord, you're patient. You didn't have to do that. Yet you want us to be have faith in you. And so we pray this week to be a victorious week, Lord, for us. For every mother here, Lord. For every child. 
for every father and husband, Lord. Give us victory in our life. Help us to walk. You gave us abundant life. Help us to walk in the reality of that. I ask in the mighty name of Jesus, our Lord, our conqueror, our King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen.